51 minutes past there of seven and you're just in time for yet another exciting and informative uh, segment here on Sunrise at Sea. And this morning we are talking about the skyrocketing of fuel prices in Uganda. Of course, I'm not an expert. However, joining me this bright and beautiful morning is none other than Dr. Fred Muhumuza. He's a Ugandan national with a PhD from the University of Manchester. He has been involved in, uh, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, he has been involved in development policy research analysis, formulation and review for over 20 years with a parallel teaching career at Makere University as well as Nkumba University and African Bible University. He has actually undertaken assignments in public policy as a researcher and a practitioner. And behind the scenes, behind the lenses actually, I got to understand that he's at, on the board of Uganda Christian University where I studied. So I am making him proud this morning. Good morning, son. Thank you for joining us Good morning, on Sunrise at Sea. Uh, seeing the name Aoma mm -hmm. reminds me where I began my education journey. Uh -huh. my primary one teacher was called Aoma. Ah, I think so. you can see. We have already started off on a good makes note. a lot for us, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, Dr. Fred, first let's cut to the chase and I want to understand what is your what, what what is your point or what do you make out of the fuel prices that have skyrocketed in Uganda? What What do you have to say about it? It's a pity that uh, it's affecting communities, and we're just talking about fuel prices, mm -hmm. but fuel prices drive other prices as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that also should not be forgotten, that there are already certain prices that are moving up. Transport prices for individuals, because mm -hmm. right now we just show pumps. But people don't just go to a pump to get fuel. They go to a pump to get that fuel, to drive to Arua, to drive to Kamocha, to drive to... Now they're increasing that rate as well. Mm -hmm. But also mm -hmm. some of them who don't have that cash have decided to let go. Mm, yes. He said, I was so surprised I couldn't find the cars. Now, and that's one thing. Now, the other part is not just the fuel prices, but the fuel availability itself. Because mm, there even mm. some people with the money. Yes. For them, that 5,000 is not the problem. Okay. But can I find the fuel? Because I have a patient to take to hospital. So the price is no longer the problem. This car must move that patient. So physically, the fuel is also not there. Now, we are not tracking that story. And that is where the lifestyle of the people is sitting. Because mm. the fuel mm. price is affecting that lifestyle. There is a person who will certainly die because fuel wasn't available. Or because they couldn't afford the new rate of getting the patient. There are children who are going back to school. And one of the things we talked about, opening schools, school fees, people didn't talk about this huge cost of the requirements of the school. Yes. And it's always a long list. Not only you look through it, people will say schools have dumped things, fine, okay, no shovels, no cement. But toothpaste, soap, is about your child. Yes. This bathing soap, the, the sweater is about your child, the textbooks, the pens. It's a long list of things now. All those prices might be rising in some places just mm. because of those fuel prices. So it's really not just a fuel price, it's the whole entire livelihood setting of Ugandans that's being dis disrupted, but also the anxiety. Mm -hmm. Really, the anxiety alone is not a nice thing to have within your own livelihood as a person. Yes. So, um, Dr. Fred, um, Energy Minister, of course, that is Ruth Nakara, did put out a statement, and I quote, she said, there is no point as to why we should term this as a global crisis and one that petrol station owners should not hike prices. So I'd ask you, do you think that this is a sign of a dying economy, or do you think that there's a, mag a much bigger issue in terms of fuel prices hiking? There was actually a, a kind of an engagement yesterday when the permanent secretary said, this is not an economic problem. Mm -hmm. And people said, but supply. Yes, supply is an economic concept. But some of the things that disrupt supply are not necessarily economics. So it has nothing to do with the economy from where it is originating. Mm -hmm. But has everything to do with the economy where it is taking us. So it has nothing to do largely with... It can kill the economy, but it's not a sign of an economic failure. Because as we know that this shock has literally been brought by people in the Ministry of Health, and there are also additions that people are saying also the revenue collection mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. who wanted to track some, and tag some of these trucks because you say we are transiting to Rwanda, to Congo, to Sudan, and then you reach Kamocha and disappear there and offload the fuel. Mm. So there is also that complexity. Now these disruptions of the supply chain of fuel is literally speaking to how should we make our decisions 
and shift through them by looking at the direct and indirect consequences. Talk about policy making. We always look and say, what are the costs and benefits of the decision you are taking? Yes. And the costs and benefits can be economic, can be social, can be political, can be very many things. Mm -hmm. There's a discussion you don't want to get into. We are having a war in the Congo. It requires fuel to fly the jets, to move the tanks, to move the trucks. So how well is the military, our military provided for? so that they are not disrupted in their operations. Yes. We, knowing that they also tap from the same sources exactly. of these same tracks we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So when we are doing policy making, you really want to come and say, what are the costs and benefits? The security, the policy. Is this the right timing for me to be doing this when schools are opening, when we are starting on? So you don't just wake up from Ministry of Health headquarters and say, this is how we're going to deal with COVID. COVID has been around for two years. Are we still learning the A, B, C, D of COVID management, really? So there are quite a number of questions that I would really want to delve into. How do we make decisions in government? Who makes the decisions? And we're into the program-based budgeting. And mm. economy is one thing, as you've put it. And looking at the effectiveness, I mean, if you're putting a yeah. policy in place, don't you want to look at the fact that is it effective? Are people going to actually adapt to it? Because looking yes. at, at the truck drivers who are parked at the different border points, they're saying it's a double charge. They're already tested in Kenya. When they come yes. here, they provide. However, Uganda is saying no you have to test again, so does that make sense? And that's the science, these are the real medical doctors. We have all grown up knowing, at least in the last two years, that all you needed was present a valid test of 72 hours. So why don't you just say, guys, before you turn up at the border, just like they've been doing with the airports, we also began testing people landing at the airport, and I'm like, has this COVID now changed that we must test everybody, or mm -hmm. are we just making money as people are trying to put it? Because that also can be hanging out there. But also the RDT test they are using is not very good when people have no symptoms. So wh what are the options have been there over the last two years? Couldn't we have shifted through this? But going back to that conversation of we look at cost and benefits, then you begin to say, fine, I want to protect Ugandans. Yes. But also I don't want to kill Ugandans using, uh, because of the implications, mm. the side mm. effects mm. of the decision I'm taking. Mm. And we are saying for the last two years, yes. when COVID has been around, we have learned how to protect Ugandans. We have many options to look at. Mm -hmm. Remember truck drivers were a conversation when President Seven first locked down? Yes. Again, they were a conversation. But the President was very clear. He said, no, logistics must continue coming through. Moving. Limit just the driver and the conductor. Also find gazetted places for them. I remember women came up and complained and said, the men, now you are saying, just drive <laughs> through Ganga. The next stop point is in Soroti. These are our husbands. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whenever they would pass through, they would leave us with some money. Now you are not allowing them to stop. Those are the social costs. But of course, health was important. Yes. So there were gazetted places. We have been there. Mm. We tested them. So what exactly is new that a person who has tested in Kenya, who can be tested in Kenya, must now come to Uganda and be tested again. But, but even while we are looking at that aspect, okay, fine, the truck drivers have, have, have been at the border points and you know there is a long queue and all that. However, are we trying to say that we do not have travelers that are coming through the same border points? How come we do not have a queue of travelers? Of so buses I'm, I'm thinking, yeah. was this particular move definitely being directed only to the people that only to the truck drivers that are carrying petrol? Those are really the issues you want to understand because if you are protecting us against COVID, the truck drivers have two people. The driver? The driver and the, and the conductor, mm -hmm. Turnboy, mm -hmm. Turnboy as they call them. And we clear just about a thousand a day mm -hmm. at some of these border points. So you're not talking about more than 3,000 people in the trucks, all of them. And some of them are transiting. And these are people who sometimes don't interact with the majority of the people. Of they the don't people. disappear in the communities. Mm. They are on their route to Sudan, they are on their route to Mpondwe, mm. and they go through. You can mm. track them. But the buses are bringing in 60 to 70 people, the taxis, the small cars. So what's the conversation around these other people? If it was about protecting Ugandans against COVID, we also know these borders are porous. Informal trade, I look at the statistics. Informal trade is very big. So what is happening out there in those porous borders? I mean, I don't understand the whole logic. But those are the stories that even as we discuss fuel prices, there is a bigger problem. A, there's, some, there's more than meets the there's eye. There's more than meets the eye. Now, 
mm -hmm. that we need to have an engagement on. Okay, now Uganda consumes almost 6.5 liters of fuel on a daily. Yeah, what does yeah, sure. that mean for the country at large? It's both. It's a good thing, really, mm -hmm. because fuel is the driver of the economy. Mm -hmm. So if I hear we are consuming 6.5 million liters, mm -hmm. there are two things to eat. Remember, we pick about 1,350 shillings as tax per liter of fuel sold. So you know how much revenue is going into government? Exactly. It's about 1,000, I think, and 60 things per liter of diesel sold. Mm -hmm. So 6.5 million liters times over 1,000, the URA is making some good money, which can go and do something good. So but now also, if, we, if we have a standstill and the truck driver is moving, that means... So going you also see that the revenues are going to be dented. Affected, definitely. And, and somebody never looked at this. And yet the same Minister of Health needs more money to combat COVID, but is actually stepping in the very source of the money that is supposed to help them facilitate that process. So that's one side. But also you're like, okay, what is the 6.5 million liters doing out there? It's moving people, it's moving goods. It's, it's a sign that you want to track and say, okay, our economy is really running. Because this is the energy that runs the economy. Mm. Besides other sources of energy, like the, 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 the solar, like the use of grid. And, so it's a good sign that we have reached that level, but you also want to compare what is, is happening in other countries. Shouldn't we have been higher than that? But also it is giving you another signal. So there's a lot of analysis that you can say, if people are spending that much on fuel, how much are they left with to do other investments? So how do we make sure fuel is affordable, is not disrupted? Mm. Because it has already shown you by you using 6.5 million liters. It's a key driver in the economy. It's a key gas of individual resources. We all know how much you will spend on average per month. If you have a kind Kampala with the jam and the rest, it ranges between 400 and 800,000 depending on the roads you live on and the kind of car you drive. Now, if your salary is two million and you're committing 800,000 to fuel alone, that person is not going to invest. Because remember, if you don't have your own house, another 500,000 is going to on rent. To rent. Mm. Another 500,000 is going on food. So you're really a subsistence person if from seven is terminology to be used for those who work just for the stomach. Mm, from hand to mouth. You're earning two million, mm -hmm. but it's literally hand to, to mouth. mouth. So you want to pick an analysis and say, oh, now that this figure has come out, forget the fuel prices. Yes. What does it mean for a lay person? What does it mean for me who is doing policy to improve people? I thought those who earn two million who have ticked the boxes, wait a minute. They are not. They are not. They are also as bad as the one who earns 200,000, but walks. Yes. It's Bogoya. Or oh, none of them is going to invest. And some of these things popped up when we came to buying shares for MTN. Ugandans failed to find money. I don't know whether it was in the mindset mm -hmm. or they actually didn't have money. Everybody would have expected middle class to buy into MTN. But unfortunately, that wasn't the they case. They didn't. MTN, MTN for all intents and purposes is not a chapati company. Well, doctor, driving back still to the conversation and looking at the skyrocketing of fuel prices. Now, in this regard, I mean, the country is already re trying to recover and is grappling with the effects of COVID-19. We have just literally sent back our children to school. They need transportation. Yep. So where is this driving the economy in the near future? It's really signaling for me, fuel prices will come down in another two weeks or three. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's good, it gives you messages. So you didn't worry about them because, as we say, it's not an economic problem. It was a shock to the economy that people introduced. They are trying to address it. Self-inflicted pain shouldn't have been there. But what messages do we pick in our strategies to recover the economy? Most people will simply be saying, give money. SMEs, fund them for recovery. Now you begin to see that there are certain policies government is making which are going to be more hurting to the SMEs besides the money. Because right now the whole conversation is banks are overcharging us. Now, can you tell me the cost of this fuel price increase on an SME business? You are a lady and we all go into saloons. These young fellows, we don't walk into a saloon which doesn't have a generator, stand by. Because we know Meme is not reliable. <laughs> Some fellows don't even have that power to do their fridge and mm, run it there. Mm, mm. So literally, some Katown, it is the generator. That runs. How have we affected that SME? So it means that in the recovery phase, we need to be really concerned about the policy decisions government is making. How are they impacting positively and negatively? What risks are they throwing 
to these people who are really going to recover the economy. It's not government to recover this economy. Government is always a parasite, but a good parasite at times, you know. Sometimes mm. you go and doctors will tell you, don't use a lot of antibacteria. We really need some bacteria in, on your, in body, your body, around you, to, to do some work there. Mm -hmm. So government is that good parasite, isn't it? Because it taxes us, it's supposed to give us back something, but then the economy, they say, no, quid pro quo, don't pay tax and expect anything. If nothing comes, still pay your taxes anyway. But something usually comes back. But that's where you want to interact and say, the real drivers of economic recovery is going to be that private sector. Mm. So please, Mr. Government, while we plan for the recovery, be mindful of what decisions you are making. Because you might give a good policy in the morning, SMEs will put money for you there in a circle. And then the decision you make in the evening and rights everything it becomes snakes and ladders. Can we remove the snakes and only leave the ladders leave during the, the recovery phase of this economy? <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Doctor. But finally, as we wrap up this conversation, among actually the initiatives that the Parliamentary Committee did suggest is that probably we, they prioritize uh, fuel trucks and give them like different routes or lanes when they can actually plus. Do you think that this is the right way to go? Interesting conversation. You know, sometimes we begin to think when there's a crisis. Mm -hmm. And once the crisis passes, we forget it. Where I come from in Bunyoro, there is a bird. They say whenever it is raining on it, it's like this mo come morning, I'm going to build a house. <laughs> the moment the morning comes and rain, so it moves. We have been there before. Yes. 2008, there was a crisis in an election in Kenya mm. that disrupted the fuel flow. Yes. We said, oh, we need the southern route to Tanzania. Mm. Oh, we need to move fuel because these fuel trucks are breaking the roads. Mm -hmm. By the way, they are still breaking the roads. Yes. Let's put fuel on the railway. We have had a conversation with standard gauge railway, meter gauge railway. Fuel should literally be on the trucks. The rail trucks, not the vehicle trucks. But now I'm hearing conversation, people are saying the owners of the trucks mm. lobby government to undermine the other decision. So for the last 15 years, we've really been grappling with moving fuel onto the rail line. And we have not done it. So the discussion in Parliament should not even be to prioritize the trucks mm. as in the vehicles, but rather the trucks as in the rail truck. Let's move a lot of our fuel there. The Kenyans are going to vote, I think, 9th of August. It's tense. Rail versus who? The Chikuyus this time have no candidate, but have people they are supporting. So what will happen in Kenya? What if, again, now it is a crisis, but as a result of when you are unlocked, you watch all these things. Yes. It's scenario-based planning. We pray the Kenyans sail through very well. It's important to us. But what if? It doesn't. It doesn't. Do we have a contingency plan? Do we have an option? Mm -hmm. We have been saying even the rail trucks as we're discussing them, why don't we use Lake Victoria? Why bother to build a railway for cargo from Kisumu, which is on the shore of Lake Victoria, to come and end up in Luzira, which is on the shore of Lake Victoria? Why don't you just use that lake from Kisumu? from Mwanza directly to Port Bell. Mm. So there is a lot to think that I think members of parliament need to be delving into mm. rather than prioritization to this. No, this is just short-term measure. Yeah. And I always tell people, diarrhea is a good thing. Okay. Still, you have a problem in your stomach, but I'm sorting it out as fast as I can. <laughs> All you need is keep drinking. Don't eat what you ate in the morning. Food poisoning is bad. Policy okay. poisoning is a bad thing. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Fred Mohumuza, for pleasure. being a part of this information and adding more light to this uh, particular issue. It's a pleasure. Thank and you. that winds up the conversation that we had for you this morning. I hope you did pick a thing or two. I hope you were able to understand that when it comes to decision making, policy analysis is very important that you understand that the policy you're formulating or putting in place, is it at the right time? What impact is it going to have? Is it going to be adapt is it going to be adaptable? Are people going to be able to take it in and even follow it? So these are some of the issues that as policymakers I think you need to think about even before you make policies or even pass laws. Otherwise, thank you so much for being a part of the Twitter jobs. Up next is beauty, wellness, and lifestyle. Good morning.